Hi, I'm Joan Rothfuss. I'm an independent curator and writer based in the Twin Cities and formerly working at the Walker Art Center. And I am here to moderate a conversation among the three curators who worked on Aiko and Coma's Naked, which was a living installation at the Walker in a gallery during the month of November 2010. And we're going to talk mostly about the process, uh, the curatorial process, and the installation and management of the installation as it went through the month of November. Uh, with me today are the three curators. Just to my right is Philip Byther. He is the William and Nadine McGuire, Senior Curator of Performing Arts. Next to him is um, Doug Bennett, who is an Associate Curator in Performing Arts. And at the other end of the circle is Bartholomew Ryan, who is an Assistant Curator in Visual Arts at the Walker. Um, first, I guess the obvious question is, um, you had three curators working on this project. Can you um, describe your various roles and talk about why three curators in two departments were working on the project together? Philip, you want to go first? Sure. Um, y this was a uniquely intensive um, um, collaboration between the visual arts department at the Walker and mm -hmm. the performing arts program, and that was very intentional. Um, we were interested in um, s inviting some artists that we felt uh, work could translate into a gallery setting, but whose history had come out of the performing arts field. And um, uh, the way we're structured in the performing arts department is that um, we talk about projects and ideas and the season. I usually extend an invitation to an artist to come or a commission. And then um, we have three uh, project managers who uh, really take on the ongoing um, oversight of a, of a project, uh, both artistically as well as uh, logistically. And um, Doug had worked with Echo and Coma before, um, was interested in um, this, this kind of unique, um, intensive project. Um, and I think actually uh, he ha had the lightest November, which turned into <laughs> the heaviest November. <laughs> uh, but I'd say we also realized that we didn't have the expertise. We, were, we mount performances in theaters and sometimes in site-specific places, but we rarely um, take on projects that really need to be uh, to work in a gallery setting. And uh, also, we thought the, the a kind of historical and um, um, even sort of theoretical point of view of uh, tr a trained visual art curator would be important, um, so that the artists w were getting um, input and the the best uh, kind of. Um, uh, information and attention um, possible, and I think that's fairly mm -hmm. unique about what's fairly unique about the Walker is that the, an artist can actually benefit from both curatorial input from a visual art trained um, um, curator as well as uh, from uh, performing arts professionals. Mm -hmm. So you were the initi initiator of the project yeah. and um, made the offer to Ego and Coma for the yes. commission, yes. and then handed it over to you to Doug, right, and as a to Bart. Manager um, and Bart yep. who's a curator mm -hmm. yep. in visual arts. Because it was Why? A, oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, Doug. Well, it was, it was a true collaboration, and we needed Bart's expertise, and he needed mm -hmm. our expertise mm -hmm. to make it all work. So we mm -hmm. actually built a small theater in in a gallery space, which we've done a couple times, but it had been a number of years. Uh -huh. And this one, for the durational aspect, we really needed uh, a tag team effort, and I think it worked pretty well, mm -hmm. all in all. Why did you choose Event Horizon for this commission? Well, uh, my understanding is that Philip and Darcy Alexander, our chief curator, were talking about this uh, permanent collection exhibition that explores sort of uh, ephemeral relationships within art, uh, you know, art as relic, uh, and some of the performative strategies that emerged like in the late 50s, early mm -hmm. 60s on. And we're using that as a kind of a thematic approach to a lot of different sort of object-based work in, in the collection, but also wanted the, the permanent collection, which is a three year long exhibition, to have a kind of a tangibly live sort of feel to it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, Philip and uh, former associate curator Dorian Chung and Darcy got together and sort of decided that Echo and Coma would be a really good fit. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I kind of inherited that, that sort of uh, mm -hmm. that idea. Mm -hmm. 
And that was indeed something, and Philip will speak to this, that from the very beginning, ACO and Coma were thinking about this in, in relationship to this exhibition. Um, to, and were, I think, to a certain degree in the way that they do uh, kind of communing um, or not communing, depending on what they thought of the art, with the other artworks in, in, in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, seeing them in the galleries once, uh, mm -hmm. looking around and noticing, mm -hmm. oh, there's a Jasper Johns there, and mm -hmm. there's a Jeff Wall over here, and mm -hmm. how can we respond to these objects by other artists that are static right. while we are moving right. in this space? Um, you initiated the commission, and um, I think it was in your talking dance lecture with or your conversation with Aquin Coma that you mentioned having had a year of conversation about the piece after you, you know, offered the commission. Right. Yeah. What was that year like? What kind of conversations did you have? And, and were you, as a commissioner, were you more of a facilitator? for their ideas, were you guiding them in a certain direction, or would you think of yourself even as a collaborator on the piece? I, I would definitely wouldn't go so far to call, consider myself as a collaborator, but I, mm -hmm. I, do, I do think that um, there was an intentionality around um, how their work might um, add to Event Horizon, and also how it might further their practice as artists. And um, part of what we do at the Walker is we both invite you know, younger artists, new voices in on a really regular basis, but we always also maintain some key relationships with artists over uh, years, mm -hmm. often decades. And um, when I thought back about the artists that we had supported uh, over time, people like Merce Cunningham and Meredith Monk and Bilty Jones, Echo and Coma um, have had some of the uh, um, uh, some of the most numbers of commissions uh, of, of any artists that we've worked with. The relationship is almost 30 years old. They also had this, you, you know, uh, their approach to dance is is very uh, is is uh, is very much um, um, time time based uh, in that they create a work that slows down your perception of time, and mm -hmm. they're very um, integrated in their own handmade um, environments, right. and and they just seem perfectly suited uh, uh, to. Um, to be invited into a gallery. Uh, and I think because in their early days they quickly were adopted by the dance world, Aiko has often said, we feel like if, if a gallery or a museum had invited us in and we started down that path, we may have been um, more visual art based performance artists and gone that route. And their work uh, for me has always lived somewhere in between, but this commission gave them an opportunity to rethink, about, rethink their work to 12 years after their Whitney installation to sort of have their older bodies, their more experienced performance sort of qualities, um, and their, their greater attention and awareness of, of the visual art world um, inform their, their, their work in the gallery spaces. And so mm -hmm. um, it not only served our purposes around Event Horizon and around what we're trying to do in thinking in a, in a more interdisciplinary way at the Walker, but it also served the artist needs, and that's an important part of what, what we always try to think about is, is, is this both going to help um, our efforts, but is it also going to help further the, the practice of, of key mm -hmm. artists that we mm -hmm. really believe mm -hmm. in? And I think um, both Echo and Coma felt that it, it truly did. Um, it also happened to coincide with their retrospective projects. So they have a three-year initiative where they're trying to look back the way uh, a visual artist might at their whole, um, their whole career and all of their output as artists and really uh, reframe it, document it, mm -hmm. um, put it out to the public. Uh, and that's you know, led to the catalog that John, mm -hmm. you're editing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, so that, that also fit very nicely as kind of a package around this right. whole initiative. Mm -hmm. I am curious though about the process. You know the conversations yeah, that you that you I, had. Were you, were you on the phone a well, lot? Were you doing emailing? Yeah, were I'm you, sorry, I didn't quite did get to that. Did you visit? Yeah, but um, get you know, that. when I t when I sat down with them and I said, well, "How do you feel about you know going back into a gallery setting and what uh -huh. would you think about doing?" And a let me just interject: piece. the the piece that you're referring to, "Breath," was the first living installation that they did, and um, was 12 years earlier, 12 years before Naked. Mm -hmm. So this is the second time that they have appeared in a gallery space. Yeah. And, they, and it's, it's funny, that it was curated uh, at, at the Whitney by a film video curator, yeah. and it wasn't, I don't think, my sense, ever fully embraced by the visual art side of the Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, that it was kind of considered a, an odd 
oddity, uh, you know, perhaps. And so I think in this instance, it was perhaps a bit more of a full embrace mm -hmm. of, of their practice and, and mm -hmm. what they could do in a gallery setting. Yeah. But I, when I asked them about it, I, you know, I knew that they were, they, were, they were every year, every 18 months, putting out a new staged work or mm -hmm. maybe occasionally making a site-based work. But I think uh, the timing was perfect because they were really thinking about what their history has been. They, they went on a tour of the Kudo show with Dorian Chong. Mm. They were really inspired. They had known his work in Japan, but they were really inspired at how it looked in the gallery, in the gallery. and they really got deeply engaged with Dorian about that artist's history, and mm. I think it really inspired them to be thinking differently about their retrospective. Um, and their close r relationship with the Walker uh, gave them the trust that they could, uh, they could try something uh, mm -hmm. um, again that might mm -hmm. really push them. Um, when they first started thinking about it, they were really one, they didn't, they weren't sure how they wanted to make their work in the space. And they were thinking maybe they would leave it wide open and they would, they would actually be amongst the art and they might even move um, from one of the gallery floors to another or um, it might be really bright white light and very mm -hmm very much where, an audience, where, where a gallery attendees could kind of walk right by them or around mm -hmm. them. They even talked at one point about um, the stage work we did just the year before called Raven had, a, had some similar scenic elements and that they might want to kind of create a connection between Raven, which uh, happened in the McGuire Theater, and the, and the next, and, li and Naked. And they were thinking maybe about dragging part of the set at one key moment through the hallways of the walker and into the space as a kind of symbolic move of their work. You know, that this was kind of a continuation, but mm. framed in a different sense of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so those things kind of went away as they continued to develop the work. Um, both Bart and I did a site visit uh, three or four months out at the Armory space in New York to see how they were coming along. Um, uh, there was a lot of discussion about materials and about how much we should or shouldn't close off their, their space, mm -hmm. what kind of um, uh, footprint it would live with in that space, um, what kind of image they wanted to try to create with that sense of the dirt mo melding into blackness and mm -hmm. almost the sense that this, the, mm. the, the environment goes on forever, which mm -hmm. in, we would, I think we all gave feedback of, I, I really like that. You know, I mean, it wasn't, mm -hmm. I think they were very open to our input or that this didn't really seem to be working very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, you That's know, they true. struggled mm -hmm. with sound. They wanted to commission um, music from, or actually work with Kronos Quartet to have a number of their pieces as a backdrop. Um, at one point they tried it and um, they really felt like it was too literal. Um, it defined it in too specific a way, the experience of being in that space. And uh, I know they were very anxious about how we would feel about that because we have a long relationship with Kronos as well. And, um, and, and I, think, uh, they f I think it gave them added confidence when we said, you made the absolute right decision. It should, you know, music doesn't really work for this. And so they let that part go. And so I think at certain key moments, um, we either supported them or maybe gave mm -hmm. some added input ask some questions, but they're fierce, independent artists. They know what they like, they know what they don't like. And, and in some ways that, that was great because you didn't have to worry about as curators that you would send them off in a direction mm -hmm. that would ultimately mm. be not successful. Yeah. And so uh, Eiko is always good about asking for lots of feedback, right. but she only takes what she wants to take. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Coma is really in many ways the kind of, he's the quiet, um, constant in that in that duo and he's really in many ways more the visual creator of the environment mm -hmm. um, and he had a he had a very clear sense as well also of what kind of things he wanted to use and as a duo you know not many artists work this way but it was interesting to be part of their back and forth a lot of times they disagreed with one another mm -hmm. and to hear how they were, you know, <laughs> negotiating these mm -hmm. questions. Yeah, yeah, every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah daily changes. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, yeah. let me ask both of you, since you were working with them during the two months they were here, what was their rehearsal process like? I mean, Aiko at one time told Philip that um, there wasn't any, really, that they all they did was think about being in the space, and that was their preparation. And you know, that, that they must have done some trials. Rehearsing, I think people think of, we will lay down and try this now and see how it looks. But there were, there were more um, about 
how it looked, the lighting and the, the atmosphere, and mm. they knew they knew what their bodies would do once they were in the space. Mm. So that part really, to my mind, okay. wasn't part of the conversation. So maybe they didn't rehearse the, the well, choreography. I think they had a they had a a time w when they were in the armory where people people were visiting them. They have like a close group of of friends, you know, very different people who they really trust, including Philip, of course, uh, uh, from many years of sort of having them see the work. So mm -hmm. there were, like I visited one time and, and it was interesting because they were lying almost in fetal position beside each other. Uh -huh. Like they were totally in contact, their bodies, uh -huh. or very, very in contact. And that was, you know, they had set up naked. This was a, at a stage where they'd, they'd come down and contained it and um, they had set it up and, and they were just sort of exploring, but it, it's kind of, it's not like a conventional sense of rehearsal. It's very um, organic and um, visual. Uh, visual. A, mm -hmm. a lot of the mm -hmm. time they, ha they mm -hmm. have this coterie of assistants who are all great um, yeah. and sort of constantly changing depending on who was free and who could come. And a lot of time you'd walk in and the two assistants would be lying there in their underwear and it would be like <laughs> throwing dirt on them. And, <laughs> you know, and, they would, and they, so they would look at the way the, the, the light was working on their bodies. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it was kind of, they were both in very subjective place, but they would step out and be highly objective as well. Because, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, 40 years of experience performing mm -hmm. and being within your own body, you know, in a public setting, you kind of know what's going to happen. So it was more while they were here and building the space it was more about the end result how it would look mm. Mm -hmm. they didn't really need to physic practice practice the physicality mm. of it mm -hmm. right. and i think that's what separates them from what we think of it in a regular sense of dancers or choreographers right. they don't really make steps they don't really time their work based on rhythm so much um, it's more comes out of a, a of an internal desire to, to hit at certain themes and so the themes of naked around decay uh, or around um, around aging um, you know it really it, they didn't want to so spe spe specifically define the themes but they they really saw it as a as a mm -hmm. as a meditative um, um, a human, maybe human, but but a living mm -hmm. um, um, experience for people mm -hmm. who came in and got a sense uh, of of a timelessness, but also of of a of a kind of mournful work in some mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And and their work is often dealt with um, desi base basic desires of thirst and hunger and um, and birth and dying and uh, uh, very basic themes. And I think. They wanted to explore, you know, some of those specific themes again, mm -hmm. but in a in a in a time where they're not, they're not required to have a 90-minute work that has a start, beginning, and mm -hmm. end, and that was really a, a sense of, uh, gave them a sense of freedom, I think, to to know that most people were not going to require come in and see it at the start of the day and expect it to have this arc theatrically, but instead that it was something you can immerse yourself in for the amount of time that you wanted to be with them. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, it's interesting because, uh, as Philip um, mentioned, there was a stage where um, there would be no, there was not going to be any uh, sort of curtains or drops. And so if you entered the galleries, the event horizon from either end, you know, there's mm -hmm. three galleries, and this was a zone in, this, in the middle gallery is where the event happened, or uh, the, the living installation. And, the, you know, there were drops that you could sort of see through, but not mm -hmm. really in the final thing. But as we were talking about, there was a time when they weren't going to be there, when the artists were really thinking about, you know, okay, we're in a gallery now, we need to behave as artists would who are, who are in a gallery context and have been invited to sort of make something in that, mm -hmm. in that space. But what became very interesting was that they ultimately, you know, they couldn't handle the Jeff Wall, for example, <laughs> this light, you know, this light box. A very uh, bright light yeah, box photograph. Uh, very high, very large. You know, really sort of, you know, processed uh, piece that's, you, you know, there's, there's no sort of sign of the hand or of material, it's not ma a material sort mm -hmm. of piece. And mm -hmm. that for them, it was just way too far outside of the kind of the aesthetic and the, the thinking they had honed over many years. So they just got rid you know got it out of sight actually it came down just before the show anyway <laughs> but uh <laughs> but you know they so so they i think so, what they did so was let me just to clarify what you're saying yeah. is they built the set partly to close Lock. off their vision <laughs> their vision of that, their, and, their, and their the audiences, and the audiences right and and what and what's very interesting mm -hmm. about that is 
that actually the more they made those kind of decisions that were being sort of very true to their own sort of uh, ethos or the, the closer I think they got to the ontology, ontology of a gallery, you know, because mm -hmm. even though it was getting in some ways more like a black box and more like a theater, they were, they were bringing things down to this very sort of spare, you, you know, they would, eventually they got rid of the crow sounds as well, they got rid of the music. Right. The only kind of thing that was creating um, uh, sort of uh, experience in there was, was sort of something that they had made themselves, like the water bottles that were dripping or, um, you know, the soil and so on. The fans. Right. And, and so this is to get to back to what Philip was just saying, that, that for them, when they were talking about the piece, they said that they didn't want to create a, a, a situation where there was a hierarchy of experience. So mm. I could go in the morning and have one experience, but somebody could come back in the evening or close to call and see the climax, you know, see the arc uh -huh. close and so uh -huh. on. So they wanted, so they were very much thinking of this idea of people being able to come for one minute or mm. coming for an hour or coming from mm -hmm. two hours and having qualitatively mm -hmm. and quantitatively, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, similar experiences. Which is not to say that there weren't kind of an incredible moments if you went there a lot of times that, that you might have only just seen once, like the one time they, mm -hmm. they touched that I saw. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but those things then kind of reward extra viewing, which is nice as well because. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That makes me think of a point I was going to ask you about um, the length of the installation, one, one month. You know, what, you, the, what we're describing, it sounds like this piece is sort of a slice. You know, it's a, it's a slice out of their lives. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end. It's just, in a way, arbitrary, mm -hmm. depending on when the museum opened and when it closed. Mm -hmm. Why one month and not two weeks? Or what would be the ideal length for this piece, or is there one? <laughs> Didn't you come up with the, the yeah. month idea? I mean, yeah. I, I, I like just the logic and, you know, it's probably partly from kind of a marketing point of view, which okay. we deal a lot with in performing uh -huh. arts. It's like, mm -hmm. it's easy for a public to go, wow, the entire month. I mean, literally yeah. November 1st to November 30th. And that's why we even, there's a long weekend at the end uh, of November and uh, Thanksgiving and things. And we, we ask them, you know, to do still that last day, November 30th, even though Tuesday. we've been closed a few yeah. days before oh, yeah. that. Um, because we wanted that sense of, of in the public's mind, a sense of, oh, a solid chunk of time mm -hmm. that feels quite extensive. Mm -hmm. And the notion also that they were six hours a day. And we debated for a while to ask, asking them, really, I really had, we had kind of hoped they'd do every hour that the gallery was open. Mm -hmm. But on Thursdays with nine hours of gallery time, it was just too long for their yeah. bodies. So yeah. Yeah. We, we shortened that and had them start at three o'clock on Thursdays mm -hmm. and go till nine at night. But it just seemed right. It's what they could afford in their time as well. Mm -hmm. We knew they needed two or three weeks for to get the work mounted in the walker, and and it was hard to imagine having them here with their busy lives and everything else going on longer than seven or eight weeks. And that yeah. that was already one of the maybe the longest um, c contiguous re residency we've ever supported. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was a big undertaking as well. Mm -hmm. And how many hours in the end did they? Did they perform? Yeah. 144 hours. Right. Yeah. Six hours a day, six yeah. days a week. Yeah, when I saw them, uh, I saw them a few times, and what they were doing looked so strenuous and so difficult that I couldn't imagine that they were doing it for six hours straight. Mm. I can't even. Well, they did take breaks. I mean, they took sure. two, yeah. two short breaks each day, but mm -hmm. this, it was physically demanding for them. You could see it, you know, yeah. in mm -hmm. how they moved and mm -hmm. uh, what they complained about each day. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, it was taxing, not yeah. only physically, but psychologically, uh -huh. I think, some days. And other days, sure. it was a breeze, I think, for them, and, uh -huh. they, and they loved every minute of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. What kinds of things were hard for them? What did they complain about? I, I, I noticed once uh, a dramatic difference in the temperature in that room. It was cool, and then it was hot. Mm -hmm. It was hard to keep a consistent temperature mm -hmm. happening. They liked it warm, but we didn't want to make it too warm for audiences because then they'd be uncomfortable. Um, I, think, I think they got lonely sometimes. I think they felt they knew when p no one was in there with them. And mm -hmm. so they'd, maybe they'd whisper to each other a little bit. Um, but I think, I think they really rose and reacted to when it was full, when the room was full of people. They really knew it, and they felt it, and they responded accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah, that, I mean, I remember like just very sort of physical, basic things. Um, after their f after their first week, they had bruises and 
you know, minor welts all over the sides of their bodies because mm. they were very insistent on having these feathers that, uh, well, I probably shouldn't say this now. <laughs> no, <it's> <laughs> these, uh, <laughs> these feathers from Indonesia that Philip mm -hmm. and a whole host of other um, uh, performing arts VIPs sort of flew over <laughs> in there. Sort of smuggled back. It's in classic Ego. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't right. think it was illegal, but it was just like she <laughs> wanted to save the cartage, you know? <laughs> so, so Philip had brought all these feathers back from Indonesia and a, whole, mm -hmm. a lot of other people. Or well, you should tell the story. Yeah, well, us, well, I mean, she, they, they're, fe they're actually made in feather dusters, and yeah. uh -huh. they come from a special special kind of black raven-like bird in Indonesia and she knew they were avail available quite cheaply those feather dusters are like an equal of a dollar each or something uh -huh. and so that was her solution <laughs> they've always had a kind of homemade aesthetic yeah. and they mm -hmm. they're very uh, industrious around figuring out how to do things for themselves and they knew a trip of American producers presenters were going to see a lot of contemporary work in Indonesia and they literally uh, talked us all into, they gave us each a couple of duffel bags and, <laughs> and then we got there and they, they had someone arranged there who had already bought the feather dusters and pulled off all the feathers and jam packed all these feathers into these duffel bags. And then we all somehow agreed. And when I was in the <laughs> Jakarta airport, like getting completely hassled by, uh, by immigration or whatever over the feathers, I was wondering, well, what, what was I thinking? <laughs> I agreed to this. <laughs> but they all got here and then they used them on right. both the, the the tarps as well as on the ground. Mm -hmm. and I, I didn't realize though that they were having physical difficulty well, laying on them. Well, you know, it was, it, it, I, well I think the feather, the feathers they learned to handle and then there was the, the rough kind of canvas of the nest, but it was all, it was all the kind of thing where almost they had set up the paradigm in a way, you mm -hmm. know, they knew it was going to happen, they knew these materials would react this way. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that they you know, it wasn't like something like they enjoyed it or anything, but it was sort of, I, I think, almost part of the process, a kind of a working through. Yeah. Um, uh, because over time, the, they, they learned to kind of soften it. They, they, mm -hmm. they were able to mm -hmm. lay the feathers in such a way that they would protect their shoulders and, um, mm -hmm. and so on. So it's not like that they were, you know, heavily uh, uh, scarred or something, but there was, there was yeah. a physical toll, a definite yes. one, you could, yeah. and you could feel yeah. it, sense it, you know. Um, Wasn't there also a tough, um, their first two days, I remember, that were two of the toughest days for them because we had planned just a break in the middle of the mm -hmm. day for half an hour. And didn't they talk with you guys about, like, this isn't working? Either? Yeah, right. Right away they realized it was, they would need more, more time to just, you know, get out of the space and go warm up for 10 minutes and have a cup of coffee. And, and it became clear to me the first day, maybe it was a, even a dress rehearsal, um, when they were there doing a run through for the entire day. They were completely vulnerable. Um, they they needed more assistance than we had really anticipated. Um, so it became clear that we would have to dive in and work with these artists on a daily basis, on a level that we hadn't thought through right. really. Um, and so Bart and I really kind of took that on and became the caretakers mm -hmm. of of them daily. You know, making sure that they got in place on time and took the breaks on time mm -hmm. and got them hot soup at the break and got them back up in, in time. And wow. so it was really. Uh, became a, um, a pretty intimate experience You're for part us. of the living installation too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I must say, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think I was away for a few days and I was sick for a week, so I mean, Doug did uh, um, like sterling work in this regard, but we both did a lot and, uh, and uh, it was honestly a pleasure. Like uh, when, you, when I look back at it now, you know, it's funny as we start talking about the piece, then you start putting yourself back into mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and into how it felt and what it was and it was, you know, a really very special, remarkable mm -hmm. um, experience. And those moments where you'd say, you know, they, they took two 15 minute breaks a day where you'd say, you'd go in and if there was people there, you, you'd leave it go a while. But if it was obvious they weren't gonna move, you'd sort of go around and sort of just sort of say to people gently, you know, guys, can you come back shortly? And, you know, Aiko and Koma In order to be, give them the break. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Aiko yeah. and Koma would be in their thing. And then you'd say, Aiko and Koma, it's okay, you can take a break now. And there would just be this moment where they would sort of like, open their eyes, or if their eyes were already open, just look at you, and they'd be like, okay. Yeah. And then they'd just get up. <laughs> but it was this very intimate, yeah, right. it didn't, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because you were kind of w awakening them, you know, bringing them out of wherever mm -hmm. they were mm -hmm. in, into the cold, harsh reality again. <laughs> <laughs> and, Pizza. you know, and that, and that little room, to me, was kind of the emotional center of that 
those gallery spaces for right. that month. And I think the gallery goers felt that too. Yeah. That here was this respite, this area I could go and have this human connection with mm -hmm. these people, these strangers, this mm -hmm. silent conversation. Mm -hmm. But it was really fulfilling on a lot of levels for people, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Philip's story about the, the, the feathers, you know, the, the working process of Eiko and Koma, they've, they've talked before about a kind of a, kind of a poor theater, not in right. Boal terms, but like mm -hmm. a, uh, they, they're very tight, they, they move, together, They're, they both have very s specific and, you know, intertwined skill sets, and then they draw on this huge sort of panoply of, of individuals and people, and it's almost like, they're almost like a wiki, like a wiki, kind of a wiki embodied culture that's just sort of moved from institution to an institution, <laughs> but drawing all of these resources with them, and, and yeah. that, that, you know, can create problems institutionally, because there's a lot of there's a lot, you know, we all know, uh, we all know the inner workings of an institution, but artists might not know how difficult such and such a, a proposition is um, mm -hmm. if it's made suddenly to, say, a photographer or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But it also created a huge amount of buy-in, like meaning everybody, I think, felt like they had something to do with the Echo and Coma project, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there was a kind of a frankness and a friendliness on their part that I think made the monitors feel really invested, made visitor services feel really invested, and I know all of us were. So, so in other words, it was a kind of a very positive sort of feeling around the whole project for, mm -hmm. for that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and yet you hinted at having to say no a few times to some of their propositions. <laughs> well, and ACO is, uh, is an amazingly adapted um, kind of, not, she's not like, overly uh, strategic or, or anything, but she really makes friends easily. And yeah. she also is, is, is very assertive around the, what she feels. She's incredibly detail-oriented. Mm. And she would get finish performing for six hours, and, and there would be 15 emails that would go out to 12 different people on the Walker staff. She got to know everyone, but also got to know what they could do for this project. But she did it in a way <laughs> that didn't alienate people, mm -hmm. and instead kind of made them feel they were helping a, these great artists succeed with something. Um, sometimes I think it was a little bit challenging for us to come in and maybe not even be CC'd on a memo and someone who we didn't even know was involved in the project at all, somewhere in the building coming up and going, oh yeah, Aiko sent me a note on such and such <laughs> too. Could we get this lined up for so and so? Because you know? they're used to kind of doing it all on their own, uh -huh. but they kind of pulled from the whole building. And I counted actually, for some reason, Olga I think asked me, um, the, the number of departments that were represented at the final hour, we made kind of a special mm -hmm. thing about the last, the last hour of their performance, right. and we invited everyone to come as kind of a surprise for them. But we had 12 departments out of like 15 total mm. represented wow. at the final minutes of their performance. Mm. And it was just a testament to how many people they had made connections with, and mm -hmm. there were people that they got to know well that I, don't even didn't even know their names until they were here. Mm -hmm. Colleague, you know, people, people I work, work with. with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people, you know, in the front of visitor services staff or this sure. or that, and mm -hmm. you know, so it's a great sure. humanizing <laughs> this thing as well. It's like yeah. um, the woman who, the J Japanese woman who helped cook food Laura for them. And, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Kayoko. 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 Yeah. yeah, and you know, they became friends, and then we became friends with Kayoko. <laughs> you know, it's just like yeah. it was wonderful in that regard yeah. too. Mm. Uh, yeah. You mentioned audiences. Um, how did you, or were you able to capture their responses somehow? Did you conduct any exit interviews, or was it just kind of casual we conversations with people after they came yeah, out? Yeah, we didn't do any formal kind of gathering of comments or anything. I mean, we were more concentrated on documenting the piece. Uh -huh. um, that, so a lot of effort went into getting really great, you know, video footage from Andy and, you know, Cameron photography. And mm -hmm. we had once talked, one, a great idea was to put it online to have this kind of naked cam, we were jokingly like calling it. Um, <laughs> like a live feed. A live feed yeah. kind yeah. of thing, so yeah. people around the world could watch. But for various reasons, that kind of went away. But we For the full month, we were thinking. Uh, right. It, it didn't really work, though. Uh, the, the idea was didn't make sense. Yeah. So it, most of it came anecdotally to us, and mm -hmm. most of it was quite positive and mm -hmm. um, really refreshing. And mm -hmm. um, people would come repeatedly and have different experiences. And mm -hmm. you know, some people, <clears throat> friends of mine, f for various reasons, w couldn't even enter the space because it, it became so emotional to them. Mm -hmm. When they walked in, they're like, "Oh my goodness!" You know. I, 
I just had this happen in my life, and I, I can't I can't really watch this now. It was so mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, all over the board. And, but most mostly, my experience when I was in there, mostly thoughtful contemplation. It really slowed people down. People sat and they watched and they joined them. Um, but you know, Thursday evenings there'd be. Mm -hmm masses of people in and out and people would blunder in and say what's this oh it's naked people let's go and you know <laughs> so it was a, a range of experiences but no mm -hmm. we started we didn't really formally capture mm -hmm. responses yeah we did capture numbers um i can't yeah. remember what the total was but it was 7800 7800 7, wow yeah. and um <coughs> that was i mean glad we did that it was sort of mm -hmm. a uh, it was an easy thing to do because obviously we had there was gallery monitors who who were keeping an eye on echo and coma throughout, so they could do it quite easily. Mm -hmm. But what, what, it, what I think, uh, from that kind of dry, technical, museological, or whatever perspective, um, what, we, what, we, what happened was probably sort of surprising for some people. I know there have been some comments like, well, you know, who's really going to sit in this for more than, you know, a few minutes? And there's all these reports about how people move through galleries and they spend 10 seconds per monochrome or right. something, you know. Um, and without a doubt, you know, and this goes beyond anecdote, this is every, every time I was there, the vast majority of people who went to see that piece stayed for at least five or six minutes, and a huge number of people stayed for a lot longer, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I can say from yeah. my own experience being in there, um, I was in it for an hour and a half before I even knew mm -hmm. that time had passed. Yeah. It really was kind of magical. Mm -hmm. yeah. The way their their movements, as slow as they were, made uh, time stop in a way. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was also very emotional too. I found that uh, mm -hmm. um, incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think that was, Joan? Because, like, on paper, it's funny. You know, if you say to people, "Yes, we've had two um, dancers. They've been naked on on a in a sea of earth." for the last month in the galleries. Mm -hmm. And you sort of explain that it, it's hard to convey what, what that is. And, and the words we use with echo and coma are in a way, they're very beautiful words, but they're, they're sort of you know, organic, emotional, you know, like, a, mm -hmm. a, th like these, these kind of very universal sort of like grand statement right. type words that you can apply yeah. to what it is that they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. So what, I mean, what did you? What was so moving for me? Yeah. Um, well, I could have been because I know Echo and Coma. I'd worked mm. with them, as you mentioned, on this catalog for project for about a year. But more than that, I think it was just the sight of two bodies naked, stripped of everything right. that could convey any kind of message about who they are, mm. s seeming to be s either struggling to be born or to come together or to die, you know, to rise out of the earth. There was something very... Um, well, there's one of those words, primal, mm. about what they were doing yeah. and not doing, and not touching, mm. and not really moving, that somehow I found mesmerizing. You know, it's not often that we get to see people in that state at all, um, presenting right. themselves in that kind of raw yeah. um, emotional state. And you realize that's a gift they're giving you. Definitely. You know, mm. and it has a certain power to it. It's just mm -hmm. like, wow, they are doing this for me. Mm -hmm. I'm a stranger. Mm. And, you know, they're mm -hmm. alone in this room. It's, it's remarkable, you know, the That's experiences. Right. Mm -hmm. And people got that. That wasn't something you had to tell people. It was just yeah. people got it very yeah. straight away. There was yeah. like this, people would go in, and there was this feeling of, oh, this is, there's some kind of contract has been initiated mm -hmm. by, my, uh -huh. by my staying or by, by my being here. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, there was a point in the armory where they were thinking of putting chairs on the other side at the mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. um, and both Philip uh, and myself separately came to the same conclusion <laughs> that, that, that what that opened up was a kind of a, a voyeurism or, or concentrating on the voyeuristic aspects of the performance where you're looking at the other people watching the piece. Whereas in the model that we ended up with, it was much more kind of a collaborative kind of watching where mm -hmm. certainly the other viewers were part of the, 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 the installation and seeing the pace of how they would move in and out and interact mm -hmm. was, was part of how it worked. But it wasn't about the, the taboo aspects of looking or the, mm -hmm. the awkwardness of looking. It was something, mm -hmm. it became quite different, I thought. Um. The other power of the piece, I think, um, watching their stage work over many years 
is that even in their site-based work, they're always quite a ways from you, mm -hmm. and, and or on a theatrical stage, which you're you're somewhat removed from, and you're watching these bodies, uh, who still somehow emit this remarkable power. But to but to be able to actually be within um, touching distance of them, mm -hmm. that they they did not have to move much to have uh, sort of. Uh, to magnifying impact. Um, mm. So the slightest mm. move of a finger, because they're such right. masters at control of their own muscles and body um, to convey th information, that it felt like everything was amplified um, to mm -hmm. be that close to them. Um, they barely needed to move for it to feel quite dramatic. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really something. Mm -hmm. I hadn't um, seen their work like that or in that kind of proximity. Yeah. Um, we were worried on logistic things, like would people feel they could go up and bother them or touch them or, you know, just be inappropriate. But somehow the way the earth was shaped, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of talk about that, a little lip, you know, we did, we were careful to have a guard right close by at all times, but everyone seemed to get it that mm -hmm. they were to settle into the seats or maybe they could stand up and look, mm -hmm. but this was kind of mm -hmm. their space and this was the viewer's spaces. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when, token, it was so close that it gave you this real sense of, you know, um, immediacy around mm -hmm. them as artists. Mm -hmm. Was there ever any talk of having the audience seated on the floor so that they were on the same level? We did talk about cushions at one point, uh -huh. <clears throat> so they'd be right down there with them, mm -hmm. quite near them. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how we got to the bench idea. Um, well, the, I think, did you visit them? Or they sent us an image, and then the, the bench was going to be, you know, standard table or right. chair height. Yeah. And then they said, let's have it, you know, 12 inches, I think it ended up as. Yeah, and which is I, perfect. Right, which was actually perfect, and it was because mm -hmm. you, you, you were on a level. But it worried me for a little bit because I was thinking about older people who, who need a bit of height. So we yeah. ended up having one bench that was higher. Higher, yeah. 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 But it worked out yeah. very well, actually. Mm -hmm. Also, we were sort of interested in a somewhat more Japanese, you know, slight feeling without overdoing it, but a, right. a slightly lower mm -hmm. sense. But mm -hmm. I, I like, in the end, that we had three different levels. You could either be standing, mm -hmm. and you saw completely different things, mm -hmm. uh, or you could be kind of at a mid-level, or you could be at the lower level bench. Mm -hmm. And so, and some people did end up cross-legged on the floor too. You know, mm. uh, or you could just peer in through the, the, the holes, holes. Yeah. and not people. even enter the space. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I see you have the model back there. Part oh, of yes, the space me... and. <coughs> Whoops, watch oh, your microphone. This cord. is exactly what Andy said <laughs> would happen. <laughs> um, sometime earlier in this conversation, one of you mentioned materials and the poor art, idea of the poor art and, and, and Aqua and Coma being very self-sufficient in developing their own sets and, and making their own um, decor and costumes, not in this case, but um, can you can you describe this? This is well. This is something kind that, of close to what it ended up being. Yeah, it came to us. I think when when they, maybe when they did Raven or when they visited in October. October. Yeah. And you know this is very Acon Coma. This is how they work. <laughs> it's a box. You can see at the bottom uh, the tape. <laughs> They've put up uh, their signature Acon uh -huh. Coma there. We went with a very different style <laughs> in the end. And there's a little picture of them c curled. You know. Oh, uh, nice. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, so this is, I mean, this is actually really where we ended up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Very close. Yeah. In, in a very amusing way, it took me a while to realize that our feathers wouldn't be this scale. <laughs> 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 but, it, but the final thing came, I was like, why are those feathers so small? And, uh, oh, they're real. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is, this is kind of what we ended up with. And I mean, Doug, do you want to talk through these materials? Because we've, we were... Well, sure. I think, I mean, the exterior, these are muslin drops that they applied feathers and rice paste glue and salt to mm. to give it this kind of almost skin kind of alive or remnant texture mm -hmm. um, but it was pliable enough that they could manually we could hang it we can get it into place and they could work with it and they could you build it in at the armory and in their studio and and it's and it's affordable too um, so that <laughs> was you know the the encasement more or less and that mm -hmm. that same material was on the floor up until the to the dirt, which you can't really see. This is the dirt area, and the nest was on the dirt. Um, mm -hmm. So, and the nice thing is, you know, this this was sort of lit from inside, and there was you know some floodlights on the exterior. So, if you came in through gallery one, you would look up and see this kind of very nice, sort of you know quite quite subdued in in some ways, but mm -hmm. but material sort of running across with this kind of special lighting and. 
um, and the same from the other side. But also, there's kind of three ways to enter the piece. So it was a very, you know, movement-wise, it felt very like the kind of it had a good sort of vibe in, in that sense. You could sort of enter and exit mm -hmm. through different entrances. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was a really big and kind of complicated discussion because mm -hmm. we really didn't uh, the flow of of people in the space was really important. We didn't want people to feel trapped that they went mm -hmm. through a door or went through a heavy curtain and then like couldn't get out easily and couldn't see where they could get out. Mm -hmm. So we wanted that sense of both an enclosed space but also a fluidity mm -hmm. around people could go in one way and come out yeah. another, you know, and all Brilliant. those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I remember coming to a really early, maybe a preview performance and just loving the sound, the ambient sound of the water dripping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then coming back early one day and seeing Coma walking around with these, you know, Poland Springs water bottles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stuffing them in this uh, yeah. bags yeah. up at the yeah. ceiling and realizing, wow, <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> that's frozen, really right? brilliant. Frozen, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. at first I don't think it was frozen because maybe it was, but the water was dripping quite fast. But right. later on it was, it was more subtle. Well, it would, it would also defrost in very random ways. Like sometimes yeah, you'd huh? get it. I mean, it was. I mean, it literally sometimes it sounded like urine. You know, like someone was peeing, uh -huh. and, which was very appropriate uh -huh. to just these very, you know, bare life objects that we were looking mm -hmm. at. And, yeah, you, know, uh, you know, which is a lot of the time it was it was more like rain and sort yeah. of beautiful and sensual in that it, way. But, you, you know, know. If you didn't know how, yeah. how simple the idea was, but really brilliant because, you uh -huh. know, you would have to create quite an elaborate mechanism to mm -hmm. have the um, unpredictable flow uh, mm -hmm. that you got right. over six hours because, you know, the ice would finally move around and then it would go yeah. really fast and then you wouldn't hear anything for five minutes and mm -hmm. then a few drips here. Uh -huh. And so it had this very indeterminate quality mm -hmm. that, that just, you know, just as simple as freezing a bunch of ice bottles and yeah. hiding them up in the ceiling. <laughs> uh. yeah. yeah, I thought that was brilliant. Um, let me ask you a more conceptual question about the piece in relation to the collection. Um, maybe I'll ask this of you, Bart. The, um, the walker has begun collecting, or maybe has been for a long time, collecting works of performance art, commissioned works by mm. artists who are performers, and the works themselves cease to, they don't have any tangible form. Mm. But the collecting um, is more around the experience, the traces that the piece leaves on the building, on the audience, on the staff. Mm. Um, how do you see this piece in uh, having, finding its place in the collection? How will you use it? How we, can you show it again? Can anybody well, else perform it? This is a very interesting question, and uh, it, and there's a lot of ways to answer it. So mm -hmm. maybe the first thing is I don't think we've actually formally, in in terms of the museum side collection, acquired that many um, works. Um, no, that's true. You know, uh, yeah. although. We, that's certainly sort of changing. And um, I think it's changing in a way that's different to a lot of other um, mu uh, m you know, museums that are considering these kind of acquisitions in that because we have this very rich tradition through the performing arts department, it's w w we're kind of almost close to acquiring per performing arts, works that exist within that economy rather than simply performance artwork. So mm -hmm. it, it's a very interesting area because the, the negotiations become even more sort of complex than they would say if you were to acquire a Joan Jonas piece or mm -hmm. I mean that's complicated too and right. I don't know what it means to acquire her performances per se mm -hmm. um, but so but but just just in a kind of a grand on a grand level when when you edited the bits and pieces catalog mm -hmm. um, the collection catalog uh, there was a real effort there to think of people like Jason Moran, you know, Bill T. Jones, um, Ralph Lemon, uh, Meredith Monk, I think, yeah. is she in there? Um, mm -hmm. There's 18 Earth. artists. And Akon yeah. Coma yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And Akon Coma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, really, to really say, you know, if we're going to do a collection catalog, these events are part of our collection, yeah. you know? And that's why Akon Coma were in this permanent collection exhibition mm -hmm. also, because there was a real feeling that once this is done, even if we don't, make a step or see a way to make a step to acquire it formally, like some aspect of the materials mm -hmm. or, um, or anything else. Um, it's, it's a kind of, it's a commission by the Walker. It's, it's happened here. It's part of our institutional and communal memory. And so yeah. that's one way to acknowledge it as part of a collection. Mm -hmm. I know that Echo and Coma, in, the, in, in uh, the course of doing their retrospective project and thinking about how their work can be documented, preserved, 
were considering making multiples. They got very excited about Joseph Boyce and mm -hmm. the way that he used bits and pieces of materials from his performances and lectures to uh, leave a trace that's physical. Mm -hmm. That could be sold, frankly. You know, it's another mm -hmm. way of making right. money for artists who, who don't have anything to sell, per se. Mm -hmm. um, have they talked about that with you in terms of this piece? Yeah, uh, well, it was funny because I was just thinking about Joseph Boyce in relationship to her work. I mean, there's a lot of, we have Klein here right now, and the fire paintings obviously right. have a lot of intersections mm -hmm. with these. Um, the, the, when you look at the class Oldenburg or, or the Rauschenberg and so on, there's a lot of sort of formal and sort of material-based relationships. But Boyce comes closest to their kind of shamanistic mm -hmm. uh, self uh, I don't want to say self-mythologizing because that implies a very manipulative process where I feel like it's quite genuine, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but they have a lot of affinities with, with him. Um, and there is something about the way in which he conveys some kind of a, a spirit or an mm -hmm. essence uh, through his multiples and the idea of sending them out into the world mm -hmm. that uh, you could sort of believe quite strongly that they would be capable <laughs> mm -hmm. of, of doing too. Right. I mean, I have, yeah. you know, I have a feather in my office and, yeah. you know, Joe King has one of their little, like a little sample of that beside his yeah. desk and these mm -hmm. are not things you throw away. Right. You want to, um, yeah. But the, the wider, broader sort of conceptual approach of Boyce, um, uh, it, you, you know, I, I'm not sure how much they've investigated those kind of contemporary art issues, like so, you know, thinking about ready, the ready-made, and or not thinking about the ready-made. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, but yes, I think they certainly are. I'm talking a lot now. No, sorry, it's but good. It's I think they certainly are artists who definitely are collectible from a museum perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, I stress we're an art center, but the museum portion where, mm -hmm. where we have a formal collection. Do you think that this piece is um, going to be instrumental in pushing them towards, in a different direction in their career, maybe towards a more visual art mm -hmm. or object-based uh, practice? I, I think this combined with the retrospective process uh, mm -hmm. that they're going through is very much opening up new ways of thinking. Their work with, you know, with the walker, with Bart, with with um, Darcy, you know, here ha I think has made them think about mm -hmm. um, their work in a slightly different way. Um, I, I do th I do think that we're in a very fluid moment in the art world, um, mm -hmm. in that performance is it, lots of organizations are thinking about how performance can be collected. What you know, we've created one kind of model which keeps evolving, and that is, as Bart said, our commissions in the performing arts department, which are number, you know, in the, in the hundreds, um, we consider our collection in, mm -hmm. in a way. Now we don't have, because of their live events, mm -hmm. and they depend on the, on the performers who, generally, who made them, there's, there's only documentation. There isn't really an object to, to, to hang on to. But we do have d documentation of all of our, on video, of all of our works and we have ex some you know, extensive files and things like that. And in some ways it's a bit more of a, it's a very different economy. So our, our model has been, we'll give you some, some resources to make something. Please credit us forever. We'll <laughs> hold on to some materials in the archives, not in the, necessarily the formal collection. Um, and we hope it goes far and wide and it has, mm -hmm. has an important um, life ahead. And mm -hmm. Naked Clearly, which is opening in just a couple of months in New York City at the Brzezikov Art Center, has four or five other likely engagements in the coming two years, um, and is, it really helped lead to a commitment from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago to, to mount an inst, um, an, a small exhibition of Akon Coma's work, um, much of which doesn't um, require their bodies, so mm -hmm. it really is about their sets and their, and their physical environments that they create. So I think it really has sent them in a, mm -hmm. in a somewhat of a of a, a new path, and mm -hmm. I think that, that the Walker we're, uh, should be proud of that, mm -hmm. whether we collect a, a physical component yeah. of this or not. Yeah, and didn't they recently get a, an Andy Warhol grant? Yeah, they did. Which is, uh, that's a foundation that 
gives to visual arts. And, and it's, fair, it, it's very unusual for yeah, people who right. have had a whole history in the performing arts side mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. to get uh, supported in that way. And, I, yeah. and they've, the, the ACO has said, it, you know, she thinks it's directly related or, or in, in a large part to, to the Naked Commission and to yeah. the, the success yeah. of what happened here and things. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we could end by uh, each of you giving us your favorite memory from this two months of working with Ego and Coma. Favorite story, favorite memory. Well, I'll, I'll always think of, you know, giving them the breaks each day and mm -hmm. waking them up and bringing them down and he heating up soup for them mm -hmm. and just chit-chatting. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. they're on break from the job. The job is upstairs in the gallery. And now we can, you know, kind of small talk and gossip about things and they can uh -huh. enjoy their soup. And, and then we, uh, I, you know, oh, it's 10 minutes up. Okay. And then they race up and they do calisthenics quickly and we all go back up the stairs and, and they get back into place and, uh, you know, okay, I'll see you at five. And thank you. And it's, it's just so sweet and so charming. And I look forward to it every day. So yeah. that's oh, my... Nice. Yeah, I mean, th there's a funny story I'll tell, but maybe it shouldn't go into the final <laughs> piece, um, which is how, uh, you know, we, we tend to, you know, I think a lot of people who go and see, see the piece have this very kind of, you know, pure sort of perception of them. Um, but as, mm. you, you know, when you see the photographs of us eating pizza in their 10 minute break, <laughs> and, you know, Aiko's bitching about something, someone who came in or, blah, blah, uh, you know, it's kind of a very different sort of experience. Mm. And um, so they had, Mayor Rybeck basically had- um, Mayor of Minneapolis. Mayor of Minneapolis. Yes, had a Democrat, not that that matters, but, um, well, it does matter, I guess, but he, he uh, he had sort of not, maybe not knowing quite what the thing would be, put it in his fall tips, you know, for city pages or it, something. It was uh, Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine. I mean, his, 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 his performing art highlights of the, of the fall. Wow. 39 steps at the Guthrie and Echo and Coma. Right. <laughs> but this is before the piece happened. So he said, dance in the Walker Galleries. And right. I, you know, oh. I don't know what he quite thought that would happen. Maybe he thought there would be, you know, sort of more conventional dance right. or, um, but anyway, so Akon Koma got wind of this, and so they would sort of jokingly ask us, you know, every few days, you know, have you, is the mayor coming? When's the mayor coming? <laughs> that was my fault. I sent <laughs> <it> the clip. <laughs> so eventually, uh, I think Karen Geisen, I think it was her, uh, yeah. who was our PR person, who just retired but worked really well on this project, and she finally got them to get him to say, "Ah, yeah, I'll come." So he said he'd come on a Saturday, and you know, it was going to be an informal visit with his wife, like, uh, and. Uh, so they were, I was working that day, so I would come to them break and they were like, has he here yet? Is he here? Did he come? Did he come? And I'd be like, no. So I asked people in visitor services to tell me when he arrived and give me a call. So, um, and Coma said, when he comes in, you cough. <laughs> so, so, and I, you well, know, I was sort of, was, yeah, it was kind of like half joking and half mm -hmm. not, but so anyway, Mayor, Mayor Ryback comes along, it's around, you know, maybe 4.15, and himself and his wife come in and they sit in, uh, in, in naked. And there's maybe like seven or eight other people there, maybe a little bit more. And uh, I come in and I sit beside them. Of course, they didn't know who I was. And I was like, <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and next thing you know, this Wagnerian performance <laughs> It was like, it, it, it ignited very slowly, but then it was like, just like, they, they, it was the most beautiful thing I've ah. ever seen. They weren't looking at each other. They couldn't have known what each other's bodies were doing, mm. but they sort of rolled away from each other very, very, it must have happened over like about 25 minutes, uh, all the way away yeah. and then back. And then Coma's arm was up and Echoes came over the thing and you're just watching it going, please touch, please uh -huh, touch. It will uh -huh. restore all my f faith, you know. And then they touched mm. and come and moved away. And it was, it was like earth shattering, you know? <laughs> so they walked out about you know, 10 minutes later and I followed them and I, you know, I introduced myself. And you know, they, were, they were very nice, but I think they were a little bit like, God, they were like, that was very, that was really you know, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they stayed for the whole 25 minutes. They stayed for quite a while. And they, then, and then I, I just asked them if they wouldn't mind hanging out a little bit longer because I said, Akon hey, Kuma would love to meet you. I said, yeah. I know it's your day off. Oh, um, that's great. So uh -huh. Aiko and Koma ran up to them and, and found them, they're like in their dressing gowns after the piece. And Koma said, hello to the Mary. He said, hello, that was really good. And then Koma found a feather in his hair and he uh -huh. said, for you. Uh -huh. And the mayor uh -huh. took us uh -huh. and that's the that's story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I, 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 I can't limit it to one. I have two quick no. ones. I'll make okay. them quick though. The first was 
Um, the afternoon right before the final dress rehearsal, they did a run through and they asked five or six of us, the three of us were there and three or four others from the walker, to sit and just take a look and give them notes, essentially. Mm -hmm. And we went in, and, and the, the decision was we were running for about 15 minutes. And um, someone forgot to start, stop a, start a stopwatch or something. And, and we sat there, and I was so taken and I was so actually relieved, too, how beautiful and powerful it was that finally at some point somebody said, I think Aiko said, has anyone looked at the time? And, and somebody said, uh, oh my God, 40 minutes have gone by. And oh. we all were convinced it was like you know, 10 or 15 at the most. Mm. And so that sense of how your time got elongated was immediate and also I think the power of the work succeeding. We had some small notes to give, but it was really all there. And, mm. uh, and then um, you know, really a, one month later, uh, that I alluded to that final couple mm. of minutes in which we tried our hardest to make it a secret, and it was James Byrne, the videographer, who, was, who dropped us a note and said, have you guys thought about maybe we should do a final wrap up? And the, we, you guys started sending notes out to everybody, and we got maybe 100 people there. And Eiko and Koma, um, Eiko kept asking, are there gonna be some people right at the end? Because we really, and, but we didn't tell them that we had spread the word at once they began their performance everywhere. And we had all kinds of people from the walker, friends from the outside, dance community members, and just, that final few minutes and then mm. the sense of the, li the, the lights coming down. They, they had a cue to, to bring it down to black and then them getting back up and Doug going up and giving them the robes and mm -hmm. everyone cheering and, you know, I just found that very moving and memorable. Um, mm. So it was the great end of a, of mm -hmm. a, of nice a month. Nice brackets yeah. for the whole month. Yeah. Great. Thanks.